So today we're going to be talking about perception, gestalt, and composition. And hopefully many of these terms are a really helpful review for all of you. But I think it's really important, especially going into our digital imaging class and thinking about developing really interesting compositions, uh, we really want to start thinking about how different principles of design are at play in our work. And as we enter into critiques, in our class, um, this lecture is meant to equip you all with useful language to be able to describe and talk about each other's work so that once we enter the critique discussion forum, uh, we can leave really awesome, robust critiques for each other. So let's get started. So uh, what is perception? Well. At the basis of our class, and really the basis of all design, is the understanding of perception. And you've probably heard that word uh, thrown around in various contexts yourselves out in the real world. Um, but, you know, usually when we talk about perception, the first thing that comes to mind is how we see things or how we perceive things. And there's usually a very visual uh, connotation to the word perception. But really, when we talk about perception, we're talking about using all five of our senses to form an understanding of the world. So we're constantly taking in information with our senses, but then we have to make sense of that information by organizing the bits of information, by forming patterns, and making connections between things. As human beings, we love finding meaning in things. We love making connections between one thing or another. Um, the image that comes to mind for me is the uh, classic photo of a detective looking up at a board where he's pinned up a whole bunch of different people or newspaper paper articles, and then he has all of those um, threads linking one thing to another, forming all of uh, these connections between uh, various players in a case or a trial. Um, and, you know, Usually when you see that in the media or on TV, it's sort of like, oh, wow, okay. I, I really don't know if that's how you get to point A to point B, but it's kind of a humorous uh, depiction of what our minds actually do. Um, another more close to home example is the idea of a coincidence. If a coincidence happens to us in our life, um, our inclination is to say, oh, this must mean something, or, oh, I should really think about, you know, what this coincidence means. Is it a coincidence or not? Um, when really most of the time, things that happen coincidentally are simply like random things that are lining up, but the human brain likes to make connections uh, to try to understand this particular coincidence or thing that's happened. So, these patterns or conclusions that we draw are compared to what we start out by knowing about the world from our prior experiences. And as we go about our daily lives, we're constantly forming judgments by comparing one thing to another, the things that we see in the world. And so in this way, we know that perceptions are also limited by these relationships. In particular, when we're comparing something or one thing to another. So we're asking, you know, what's big? Well, compared to what? What is light compared to what? What's smooth compared to what? Um, and personally, I feel like, um, you know, if you can even look at meme culture as being a huge carrier of this human impulse. Uh, the Getty Museum recently put out uh, an art museum challenge where they said, while you're in quarantine, you should create an art recreation of a famous painting while you're in your home. Uh, and I've included the link with a bunch of these examples. But while you look at this original painting of uh, uh, the Virgin Mary with Jesus the Child on the left, which is clearly, you know, a painting taken from a Catholic church, and you look at the photo on the right of a woman with a, a blue towel over her head and a dog, you can't help but keep looking. Your eyes keep sort of darting between one image and the other looking at the different ways in which uh, this person accomplished this uh, challenge or task. And I've included another uh, example on uh, this slide as well. But there's 
a lot of really interesting ones and um, interesting to see how people sort of take the comparison of, well, how do I get this beautiful, flowing, lush, like dress out of a Flemish painting? Well, I do have this like really plush, fuzzy blanket. I might be able to use that. Anyway, I digress. Please check out that link. It's hilarious. So the theory of perception comes from uh, a classic psychological theory called gestalt, which some of you guys might have heard of, some of you guys might not have. Um, the word itself is untranslatable directly to English, but we can understand it by uh, thinking about this idea of configuration and wholeness. So gestalt is sort of the idea of configuration and wholeness. And Gestalt is a branch of psychology that was originally developed in the 1920s by Max Wertheimer, who coined the term in 1912. And uh, this term helps to understand perception by saying that parts can better be understood in the context of the whole, or as unified wholes, and not by examining and breaking down all of the parts individually. So you might have heard the phrase, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's actually, that translation is actually incorrect. It's more like you want to think about the other, or the whole as being other than what the parts are. And um, I've included a picture here of Max Wertheimer as, as well as uh, a fun meme of Max Wertheimer for you to consider. So... Um, if we look at this graphic, for example, uh, that I just lifted off the internet, um, an interesting design, when you first look at it, you probably perceive, oh, this is the letter Y on an orange background. Your first thought is probably not, you know, this Y is made out of all of these little gears and cogs, and the background is all of these uh, little bolts that are comprising the orange background. In fact, when I first saw this image on Google, before I really examined it closely, I thought that those little gears were tiny white flowers. Uh, but I knew for a fact that the first thing that I saw looking at this was the Y uh, that's composed out of all of these tiny parts. And that is, in essence, how our minds operate in taking in information first. We perceive the whole first, and then we start to break it down into parts. And um, so we're getting closer to how this relates to design. Uh, the visual experience is not exactly like science. Um, visually, it means that we can understand or perceive the whole before the parts, just like what I just did with the, the Y on that orange background. And the whole is actually more or a different experience than simply the sum of the parts. Uh, it is other than the sum of the parts. The parts can interact, and this interaction changes them and what they are. So the pieces might be the same, but if you move them around, the whole is very different and everything changes. And uh, Gestalt can be broken down into various principles, which we'll get into detail in a little bit here in this lecture. But uh, I love this graphic that I've included on this particular slide because each of the letters of Gestalt is a visual description of um, what we're kind of talking about. So the G, proximity, we know that the squares are close enough that we start to form the, a connection between them and see a G from seeing a bunch of squares in front of us. Uh, the E, common fate, all of these lines point the same direction in that E and then we understand that as, as being an E instead of a bunch of red lines and a bunch of black lines. They're all the same to us. We see the E first continuity in the S. Um, we have similarity in the T. We see the T even though um, it's actually a block of different circles, but because the T is in black and the other circles on that particular board are green, uh, the T sticks out. Um, the A closure, we're missing a whole piece of the left-hand side of that A and yet we still read it as an A because our eyes and our mind closes that gap for us. Common region, we have an L outlined uh, and enclosed by the color blue, so that stands out from the rest. And then we have symmetry, where uh, even though we're missing the middle part of that T, 
our eyes again kind of close the gap in that symmetrical space. So two more examples. Um, you know, we can't really understand a cake by taking a bite of flour, taking a bite of a raw egg, and a bite of brown sugar, right? It's the way that they all, all those ingredients work together to form that cake. Um, similarly, a face is more or different than a series of features, and the ordering of those features and their placement is far more important uh, in recognizing a face than the specifics of the individual features. So, for example, um, some of you guys might have been in a relationship at one point where uh, your significant other asked you, without looking, what color are my eyes? And if you were literally clueless about that and your partner got upset with you for not knowing what color their eyes are, uh, it's actually grounded in our human nature not to remember tiny details of the face, but rather the placement of how far are the eyes from the nose, from the eyebrows, from the mouth, whereas the color of the eyes is a tiny detail that doesn't help us to put together that full picture of the face. So if you've been on either side of uh, that argument in a relationship, just know there's no need to be angry or mad at each other. It's totally normal. So another element in Gestalt is the idea of order. Humans love order. We need it. Um, I actually included on this slide a boring picture of one of your uh, DePaul University classrooms because, I mean, you know, obviously you're not attending class right now, but you all know what this looks like, right? You walk in. It's fairly blank. Everything is in the shape of a square, a rectangle from the tiles of carpet on the floor to the actual tables that you walk up to, to the shape of the projection screen, to the ugly fluorescent lights on the ceiling. Everything is a grid. Everything is geometric. Everything is symmetrical. Uh, but when you walk in, you look at the big picture before looking at all of the details you look at this photo and you say, oh, this is a picture of one of my classrooms at DePaul. You don't necessarily say, oh, the chair in this classroom is the color black. Or you don't necessarily say, oh, it looks like that computer up at the front is a PC and not a Mac, right? Uh, if we try to constantly figure out all of the details to something, or if we noticed all of the details first, uh, we'd go crazy. And this is partly a biological response. We have to take in the information as a whole in order to move forward. And if we get too caught up in the details, this can set us back and take unnecessary time. So, interestingly. Uh, if given a set of dots or a series of dots, we try to connect them, we try to see patterns or find an image. And so on this slide, I've included two pictures of uh, Dalmatian. The one on the left is really just a bunch of dots out of context or frame, um, but you could probably decode pretty quickly that there are two Dalmatians uh, on this slide by making all of those connections between the dots in your mind to have it pop out from the background. And as a final example, let's say an airplane goes by and I ask you to describe it to me visually and really quickly. Uh, what do you do first? Well, you probably don't start drawing a tiny little picture of one little window next to another little window next to another little window. Your impulse is probably to draw some kind of outline of the entire plane and then fill in the details like the tiny windows on the side. Um, another example, you walk into your room, how do you take it in, understand it quickly? Uh, your first thought looking at this room in the image, you know, this is probably a young person, uh, a dorm room, you can kind of see the institutionalized furniture and the bed frame in here. Uh, and then you start to really uh, look around and read some of the images as you get into the details and you're like, oh, this person has a Rage Against the Machine poster in the room. Oh, this, this person has like four dirty towels hanging up. Uh, oh, this person has um, a live concert poster for the gorillas next to some nice like landscape Hawaii magazine cutouts. Um, 
and you can really find yourself spending some time with this. So we see it all at once. We take in information holistically. We try to organize it, order it, compare it, and we see the big picture, not the tiny details. So as designers, we have the opportunity, the really interesting opportunity to play around with that, to experiment with that. Uh, we have to think to ourselves, well, how much information do people need? If we don't provide some sort of structure or organization surrounding what we're presenting, even if it's not readily obvious, people will probably find it to be uneasy and disturbing. And so here, I've included two examples of bad design. Um, check this image out on the left. IT technology, the T is like supposed to be the technology, but then it says N department information. This is, this is uh, an interesting one because there's no visual hierarchy. I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at first. And as my eyes start to deconstruct this, I, I start to see things like information, but then in department doesn't quite make sense. Or the image on the right, um, this is an anti-smoking ad that was uh, plastered onto this Metro bus. Smoking is not our future, but because the bus still has to be um, uh, shown to be a school bus, uh, they left in the school sign on the back. And so your eyes start to connect quit school instead of take action, take control, quit smoking, which is at the bottom. So you can kind of see the visual hierarchy is so messed up that now all of a sudden the school bus advertisement seems to be telling uh, the outside viewer to quit school, which is really bad design. Um, if we give them too much information, maybe they're not as engaged with looking at it. Uh, we can hint at information, knowing that the viewer will eventually connect the lines, fill in the gaps, and this makes it more active for the viewer. So in these two examples, um, I, I find ridiculous, insane uh, nail design to be fascinating. And what's great about looking at this image on the left, um, all of the, the nail designs are so intense. They're, they're like almost like pop-up book style. And the first thing that I noticed looking at this is um, like how much stuff there is. But I'm not really seeing any details or quite understanding what's going on. It just looks like someone piled a bunch of information on their nails, which is kind of awesome and definitely the kind of thing that you would have to get really up close and personal with. So that's an example of something that is super detailed, maybe a little bit too much, maybe a little bit over the top, but works in interesting ways. The image on the right is the classic Shepherd Fairy Hope poster of Barack Obama, which I'm sure many of you guys have seen. The interesting thing about why this design works so well and is so interesting and I think has become an iconic piece of our country's sort of uh, presidential paraphernalia and story is the fact that Shepherd Fairy took away so much detail, but left enough for us to recognize and fill in the gaps or the dots that this is clearly Obama's face, Obama's eyes, thinking back to our discussion about how we read a face or how we understand a face, uh, we can very quickly put together that this is the president of the United States or a campaign for his presidency. So Something to think about. Um, how much information do you include? How much do you take away and still have it be a great, wonderful, uh, interesting and compelling design piece? So thinking about Gestalt in terms of our current historical moment, um, many art theorists, estheticians talk about how now we're living in a postmodern time period or post-1945. It's very possible that after our global pandemic is gone, uh, we will probably be living in a time that is, um, you know, potentially called something other than postmodern or post-postmodern, but there'll probably be a specific name for it. So we're living in a really interesting time period right now where 
perhaps there's a transition. And we've been talking about living in a postmodern era really since the 1960s and 70s when more and more information um, was coming out about how what or what the dominant aesthetic is. And right now, the aesthetic is to throw out a lot of random information or seemingly random information. And you're probably really used to it. You see things quickly uh, and take in a lot of information on the computer, on the TV. Um, a great example is sampling in music, uh, putting different types of styles or different things together, uh, and film. Um, but within the chaos, there is still a lot of order and unity or the consistency of seeing it all on the same size or format or screen. For example, as you're scrolling through Instagram, you might see a bunch of different artists, a bunch of different musicians, uh, your friends putting out a lot of different information, but because it's all within that same context or screen, your mind formats that as being unity and we still feel that sense of control over the information. So on this slide, I've included two pictures, one which is uh, an interesting sort of postmodern design by an artist that has three panels or three frames where the woman in each frame, her head is blocked out by um, a different color. And then on the right, these are three people uh, simultaneously creating or dancing to Old Town Road, the Lil Nas and Billy Ray Cyrus track. Uh, and I think this is an interesting comparison because, you know, and Nine Inch Nails. Thank you, Ryan. Um, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting comparison because uh, we have three different interpretations of this cowboy dance that Lil Nas X originally put out on TikTok. Uh, but the track itself is a mashup of uh, a, a trap hip hop beat alongside a sampled moment from a uh, Nine Inch Nails song. So we have all of this stuff coming together and then this cacophony of information, all of these people wearing cowboy hats and plaid shirts and jeans dancing to the same song. And um, I think it's interesting how cultural movements can create order or what to expect or to predict even out of something that's a total chaotic uh, mashup of sounds and influences and um, places where you might experience these things. Uh, the principles of Gestalt, we already kind of talked about. This is one other example of common region, proximity, continuity, closure, symmetry, similarity, common fate. Um, you don't have to have all of these memorized and down, but I, I do think that seeing more and more examples of the principles of Gestalt or examples of Gestalt is interesting because you can really start to grasp hold of what these concepts are when you do see them playing out in a design piece. And uh, closure, for example, um, you know, if generally if I am giving a lecture like this uh, to the class I'll be drawing lots of images or pictures on the board and one thing that I like to do is quickly draw a picture of uh, a circle on the board that doesn't quite connect and I'll ask everyone in the class so what did I just draw a picture of and there's usually three people who blurt out all of a sudden you just drew a picture of a circle and the answer is actually no I didn't I drew this weird organic shape a circle has to connect, a circle has to uh, conform to um, pi or the 3.14, 159, all of that sort of thing, and it has to be perfectly round. And the thing that I draw on the board is far from being a circle, but our minds immediately form that connection and call it that. So this is a closure. So moving forward, what is design exactly and how does this relate back to everything? We've started uh, kind of digging into this, but I think it's important to define what design is. And generally speaking, we use the word design as both a noun and a verb. Uh, it's both the process of designing, the noun, as well as uh, the end result. And so, uh, or the process of, the, of designing being the verb and also the end result, the design as being the noun. And it's been defined as 
to invent, to have a plan for something, to have a goal or purpose, a visual composition, a reasoned purpose, intent, or solution. Uh, I like to say to all of my classes that we are not creatives. We're not creative people. We are problem solvers and we're the best problem solvers. And that is a hallmark of what makes a good designer, a good artist, a great musician. You have to problem solve it through a given challenge um, and figure out what that is and put the time towards the process of figuring out how to solve any given challenge. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely creative is a great word and everyone I hope is being creative while we're all quarantined and figuring things out as, uh, as the globe, as the planet Earth right now. Um, but there's a lot of challenges and problems to solve as well that design can play a part in. Uh, this might be review from your high school art class or your high school design class, but um, generally speaking, when we talk about design, we speak about the elements of design, the parts that we have to work with. Uh, so for example, line, um, a, a mark between two points. We have shape. Um, whether they're geometric or organic shapes or abstracted shapes. We have texture, the actual surface of any given object or the look and feel of it. We have value, which is how light or dark an area looks. Um, and in this example, I've included a gradient, which is a great way to visualize value because it shows everything from dark to white, all of the shades in between, and can be used to create depth to create a pattern, to lead the eye through a piece or to emphasize something. There is um, color, which is used many times to generate emotions, define importance, create visual interest. Um, and then space, which is the area around or between elements in design. Um, and that can be used to separate or group information. It can be used effectively to give the eye a place to rest, define importance, or to lead the eye through the, throughout the design and more. And we're going to talk a little bit about breaking up a composition and a format as far as uh, space here momentarily. And so composition, or the word composition, we use in order to talk about the way in which we deliberately arrange these parts all of these elements of design in order to best achieve our desired end, which could differ, uh, whether it's efficient, visually pleasing, attracting a desired audience. And although composition requires different parts, it generally cannot be considered except for as a whole. All of that gestalt theory, which we talked about, plays a part in our understanding of what composition is. In the image that I've included on this slide, uh, it's sort of like looking through your camera's viewfinder or looking at the crop tool in your Instagram. You notice many times um, your crop tool in Photoshop, in Instagram, in Lightroom, whatever program you're working in, uh, creates a sort of nine piece grid where all of these lines rest on the third. And generally speaking, um, the sort of intuitive way to balance a composition is to put your subject of interest on a third uh, to create a uh, sense of asymmetrical balance or you can put your subject in the center or around that center frame which will create a sense of symmetrical balance. So these are things that we can play with as designers as we're putting our composition together. But it gets more complex than that because there's also the principles of design. Again, hopefully this is some review for those of you guys who took some art classes in high school or have taken other cl art classes at DePaul. Um, we, we're talking about how the elements are arranged and organized. Unity refers to color, shape, texture, and value, how those things work together. Emphasis, which is through contrast of value, hue, shape, uh, more powerful imagery that really uh, draws you in rhythm and movement. So we're talking about uh, repetition of shape, line, and color to create either regular movement, irregular movement, progressive movement across the space of your format or your composition. Your space and format divisions, major structural divisions, thinking about things like the rule of thirds, which we just talked about in the prior slide. 
And then balance. Uh, we also just briefly talked about whether that balance feels symmetrical, asymmetrical, radial, or whether balance is created through value, shape, color, or texture. Lastly, the idea of contrast. Uh, how elements sort of sit up and against each other and where we have our darkest darks, our lightest lights. All of these principles play a major or minor, minor role when we compose. They're not always all uh, at work in a given piece, but it's always a balancing act. And one of the things you'll learn in this class is sort of balancing between unity of things and variety of things. Too much of anything is sometimes really limiting or counterproductive. So as designers, we're, we're trying to create a sort of dialogue of tensions. We're trying to strike a balance, bridge things, we're trying to make transitions and relate back to the page as a whole. We're trying to create a dialogue of tensions because that's where things really get interesting. And so how you choose to structure these elements and create your composition will affect the viewer's perception and will also allow you to express things by how you present them on your page. And this is the really fun and interesting part about where you start to control the content as the designer. And here I've uh, shown a little screen cap of a Photoshop project in progress of um, sort of turning this uh, portrait of a woman into a really interesting digital collage. All of the decisions that you make take place within a given format. And so when we talk about format, we're actually talking about the space in which you are creating or designing. It's your canvas, it's your artboard, it's, um, it's the big tire outside, it's a round format that you've decided to paint or spray paint and hang up on the side of your apartment building. It is the format. You decide what happens and you can take control of the comparative relationships that happen within that format in different ways. Generally speaking, um, formats can come in many different shapes and sizes, and uh, those different shapes of what format you're working in have different connotations. So if you're working within a rectangular format, which is you know the piece of paper in your notebook, it's your printer paper, it's um, a large poster board, a rectangular format uh, generally connotes something that's really solid or steady. We relate to it physically. If it's a vertical uh, rectangular format, it feels like a body. If it's horizontal, we relate to it because it feels like a landscape. And all of the physical laws of gravity apply, and it's, uh, it's something that we know. It's something that we feel. Um, it feels bodily. It feels like looking out uh, a window. If you're designing within an uh, circular or an oval format, um, generally speaking, this connotes something that feels a little bit less steady, like it could roll away. It, it connotes more fluidity, more motion. Um, sometimes the circular format can connote something that feels more gentle or has a sense of spirituality or sublime. Um, it feels unified. Uh, it's a little bit different than how we see and how we feel. Uh, and so, generally speaking, circular versus rectangular formats are described as such. And of course, you could create a format which is a interesting cutout organic shape that's neither circular nor uh, uh, rectangular, and that might connote its own sort of sensibilities depending on what you're creating or what you're designing. When we talk about the picture plane or picture field, we're talking about the orientation, whether it's horizontal or vertical, as far as the space that you're composing in. And um, the picture frame is what we refer to when we're talking about the border or the edge of the frame and where you're composing something. And honestly, the, the way that the picture frame functions has really changed pretty dramatically throughout art history. The ancient Egyptians considered the frame to be the edge. 
So shapes responded to it, followed it. The frame uh, was sort of uh, what contained all of the hieroglyphics. They're all in these like sort of rectangular uh, boxes. But then the frame became more of a window. Um, shapes went beyond it, and the viewer assumed that if the frame moved, we'd see more of the image or it continued. And this is really sort of what you'll see in um, church paintings during the Renaissance, uh, Flemish paintings. In 20th century art, um, we've really challenged this. So this is sort of 1900s and on. We've started to see the format less like a window uh, and more like an object or a surface with edges. And here is um, the famous painting that many of you guys are probably familiar with uh, at the Art Institute, uh, 20th century impressionist piece. And um, we have moments where, you know, the guy in the left, his, uh, his pants, his reclining pose sort of goes off the edge just a little bit, but for the most part, everything is really quite contained within that space. So the last thing, um, the last major point to mention as you're designing, as you're composing uh, for, especially moving into your second project with the imaginary landscape, um, because with the first project, the one in 20, a lot of the format decisions have already been made for you because you have to design it as a grid and make that composition feel right. But moving forward, um, you'll be designing on a canvas from scratch. And so I'm going to talk about how different places in the format feel differently when you're looking at them. The center of the format is the most potent space in the field. So unless you want something that's very bold, direct, uh, or simple, you should generally speaking avoid placing a whole lot of visual weight there because it will very quickly become overly dominant. Sometimes the center is where it feels like the center and it's not the actual mathematical uh, physical center. So even if the circle that I've created within this format isn't in the perfect center of this because it's close enough, it is already uh, sort of that dominant weighted thing. The edge. Uh, you should always be aware of the edge and your shapes or objects relation to it. And um, sort of like a magnetic field, the more tension, or there's more tension as you get closer to the edge. And then when you cut through the edge of that format, like if the circle were overlapping uh, this over the edge here, we'd feel a little bit less tension going through um, the edge of that format. So try to avoid shapes that line up too perfectly with the edge or come diagonally right out of the corners because those will very quickly feel um, quite dominant and quite weighty in your composition. In your uh, format, the top and the bottom do not feel the same. And again, this goes back to our sensibilities as human beings dealing with gravity and our physical experience. We know that heavier things fall to the bottom. So usually in a composition or a rectangular format, there's usually more stuff at the bottom. Think landscape paintings, think um, portraits where, you know, there's, there's more space above the head than there is um, beneath, right? You kind of crop it in uh, to be that classic portrait style. When things are higher up in the field, it's like they've overcome gravity, especially if they're big. And this gives them a lot more visual weight and also the connotations of lift or sometimes joy even. Like if you think about a big batch of balloons going up into the sky, that's a pretty large, that could be a pretty large object, but that feeling of weightlessness, one, we know we're looking at a balloon, which helps, but two, um, it's not something that we're used to seeing as far as large things being up in the sky. It can start to feel really awkward if a composition has a lot of weight up at the top. Uh, thinking about the right and the left, um, things on the right seem heavier generally, slightly larger or more powerful, typically because we read left to right and top to bottom, and you can use that concept to direct your viewer. Again, I'm breaking down how formats feel, sort of physically looking at them, 
a lot of the design process and putting together a composition is going to be more of an intuitive experience. So that means placing things on your, on your frame as you're making your digital collage, stepping back, thinking about them, looking at them from a distance, observing them close up, not getting too wrapped up in the details, but constantly reminding yourself to zoom out, to look at what, it, what this composition looks like from further away and see how it feels. Um, here, I've made a comparison between, um, you know, a, a format where we have two shapes, one's a triangle and one's a circle, and they're both empty shapes. The minute I fill that circle in with black, the right side of this composition all of a sudden feels quite a bit heavier because I've added value to that shape. And again, I mentioned this in our earlier conversation talking about the edge of the format, but uh, corners. Try to avoid things coming directly into a corner at a 45 degree angle. It will feel overly rigid and structural and will immediately take uh, your viewer's eye or your eye to that space. So, um, Lastly, shapes in the composition, I've shown you a bunch of examples, but what a lot of what we can learn about overall compositions can be found first in shapes, and compositions deal with relationships. So you start by having a simple relationship, which is a field and one shape. Um, but as you've seen in the last couple of images that I've just shown you, that relationship isn't necessarily super simple because it constantly matters where you position that shape within the format. Um, speaking of shape, when we're looking at a design or a composition, we're generally talking about a figure and ground relationship. Um, the figure is generally seen as the positive shape that sits spatially in front of a larger plane or field or a background. Um, and then the ground is something that recedes into space. It's less important. It commands less attention. Uh, it's the landscape, whereas the figure is the person on the landscape. What's interesting about some optical illusions, like this picture that many of you guys have probably seen of the, the vase, which is also simultaneously uh, two people looking at each other, or this image on the right, which is the optical illusion of the old lady versus the young lady, generally speaking, our eyes have to flip in order to see one or the other, and we can't see both of them simultaneously because our brain has to flip what is the figure, what is the ground, as far as the black space versus the white space in each of these depictions. Um, if you can't see either the old woman or the young woman, by the way, I can explain really quickly. The young woman's eyeball is here with her little nose, and then she's wearing a feather here and then a little choker on her neck. The old lady, uh, this is her eyeball, which is the, the young lady's ear. This is her nose, really big, sort of really big nose. Um, and her, uh, her other eye is over here. And the, the thing that we thought about as being the choker on the young lady is the old lady's mouth her chin underneath. Simple shapes um, are generally geometric shapes. They're easy to grasp, understand, remember. They have a simple structure. There's not a number of parts, but how the parts are organized. They're geometric. They have a predictable axis. They're regular, simple shapes. Whereas organic shapes, we generally talk about as being complex. They don't have a simple structure. They're irregular. They're unexpected. It's like it grew in, uh, rather than was planned. These shapes feel more animated. Um, they have more of an exaggerated axis. They feel gestural. It's like they're, they, they feel like they're made of rubber. They can be dynamic and lively as opposed to being um, more static and calm like your uh, geometric shapes. And with that, I hope you have a good idea of a few of the basic concepts in design, principles of gestalt, the principles of design, elements of design, and understanding of composition. So thanks everyone.